Good evening, folks. My name is uh, Al Shreesheim, Alan Shreesheim. My friends call me uh, Dr. Al. I'm the former director, director emeritus of the Argonne National Laboratory, member of the National Academy, and uh, president of the Chicago Council on Science and Technology, an organization that is dedicated to raising the awareness of the importance of science and technology in our society. For members of uh, C2ST who are here tonight, I don't have to tell you what we're up to, how we work. For members of the uh, Harvard Club, delighted to uh, join you, be a part of uh, one of the sessions that you have. We are, of course, quite interested in uh, making contact with uh, former alumni of Harvard and attracting them to join the Chicago Council on Science and Technology. <coughs> you can access us on our website, uh, c2st.org. So with that, I would like to introduce my old buddy, Ked Fairbank, who I've known, I guess, ever since I have been in Chicago. We've been on trips together, and the Havardians know Ked, and uh, the Chicago Council people will soon meet him. So, Ked. Thank you very much, Alan, and, and welcome to all of you. Uh, um, as Alan said, we've known each other for a long time, and, and we talked before about uh, putting together some joint events between the Harvard Club of Chicago and, and Chicago Council on Science and Technology. And, and, and I, would, I would say to, to one, to all the people from Harvard, welcome. Secondly, uh, the Chicago Council on Science and Technology is a wonderful organization as well. I, I, I looked and I get their, their most recent website posting and I saw they're, they're about to have a session on map, map making and historical map making at um, the Oriental Institute in, at the University of Chicago. And, and uh, map collecting is something I've done for years and, and it's that sort of synergy and range they cover which is fascinating as well. So um, I would encourage you to look at their site and uh, uh, c2st.org and uh, if it's of interest participate and or join because I think it's a great organization growing and, and, and has a lot of interesting programs. Um, a couple notes just for the Harvard graduates and, and one note for the Harvard graduates and the others if you're interested. Our annual award dinner is March 2nd at the Chicago Club. Our awardee is Pat Fitzgerald. Uh, Pat Fitzgerald was the former United States Attorney for the Northern District of Illinois. He has been involved uh, in those elements of history which have faced us all from uh, the, the prosecution of the uh, terrorists who tried to blow up the World Trade Center the first time, uh, sending two governors to jail here. Um, <laughs> I, well, it says Democrat and a Republican, so you can't accuse them of being biased. <laughs> um, <clears throat> certainly the, 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 the trucking payoffs, the, the uh, G. Gordon Liddy, uh, the v Vice President's uh, Chief of Staff, uh, on, on a point of ethics which was interesting one, which, which is uh, uh, do we send people to jail for perjuring themselves? And his point was we certainly do because our whole criminal system depends on that. So uh, uh, he is giving, he is uh, rare occasion, he's the awardee. He also is the uh, first awardee who will be the featured speaker as well. And it's the first talk he's given since he resigned as Attorney General. So uh, if you'd like to come, whether you're a club member or not, doesn't matter, we'd love to have you there, uh, March 2nd. We're particularly pleased tonight to have Woody Hastings. Um, uh, 
uh, here to talk to us um, on a subject which not all of us think about every day, but which is of great interest. And I, I, I included on the website a couple links to, to, to uh, um, on the Harvard website anyway, a couple links to, to um, videos on it. Fascinating. I would call your attention, first of all, to uh, the book uh, Woody's got a, uh, coming out with Therese Wilson, Bioluminescence, Living Lights, Lights for Living. Woody is a, a, a um, born and raised in Delaware, as I remember, and, and uh, went to Princeton University where he, get, he got his PhD from Princeton. Uh, worked for a brief time uh, in, 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 in the wilderness, and then saw the light and came to Illinois. <laughs> and, and, and over 13 years worked at uh, Champaign-Urbana and Northwestern. Um, established his links on the West Coast and the East Coast as well to Woods Hole, and then uh, joined the faculty at Harvard. When I was printing out the, the uh, biographical notes for Woody, um, which I have here, um, the, the printer kept going and going and going. I thought, Jesus, what's wrong? So I looked, and, 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 and the biographical notes weren't too long. It was the list of publications that went on and on and on. So whether he's a researcher or writer is a point he can answer. But um, I think it's a fascinating field. He certainly is one of the leaders. He was a housemaster at Harvard. He was a professor at Harvard and continues uh, to this day his work in the area, which, which is a fascinating area. I mentioned if any of you have seen the life of Pi, you've seen bioluminescence uh, in, in a very vivid sort of way. So without taking up any more of his time, we'll go through his talk and then have some Q&A. It gives me great pleasure to introduce you uh, to Woody Hastings. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Ked, uh, and you and your colleagues for the invitation to, uh, to come to Chicago and address this group. Uh, <clears throat> I was very, very impressed by his advertisement for this. Uh, I don't know, have you worked in advertising in, over your year? I mean, it was quite, uh, quite a, uh, uh, a wonderful uh, account that he mostly wrote himself from the information available uh, to tell what I'm, what I'm hoping to talk about or what I'm going to talk about today, uh, which is a subject on which I've worked uh, my entire scientific career. Uh, and you see it in the title here, which of course is the title of the new book, which has just been published. Actually, it hasn't been officially published, but you can actually get it. As you can see, we can get it, and so forth. And the picture that it shows here is an unusual one from <coughs> Gippsland Lakes in Australia, where a fantastic biological succession of organisms ended up with a, a, a massive growth of cyanobacteria which, on which the bioluminescent organs, organisms feed. So they eat these bacteria and they became massive. So all over the Gibson's lakes, <coughs> these organisms, which are Noctiluca <coughs> miliaris, uh, oh, this is Scintillans, <coughs> it, it's about a, a bigger than almost a millimeter in diameter. Uh, and it, it has a tentacle which allows it to pull in bacteria and eat them. It's sort of like a paramecium or something like that that can, can ingest things. It's not photosynthetic. And they emit light when they're stimulated. And the picture we see here is the coastline, uh, and the book cover has a, a little... Oh, no, I'm sorry. Excuse me? I thought you went the wrong direction. Oh, yeah, no, it's the coastline where there's uh, light waves uh, that are causing the stimulation, a mechanical stimulation is what's responsible for this. And that mechanical stimulation sets up a wave, uh, electrical wave, exactly like a nerve impulse in the membrane of the cell. And as it w sweeps around the cell, it triggers the light emission in the uh, actual <coughs> Uh, organelles that are responsible. Can we turn these front lights off maybe? 
Anybody in control of all that sort of thing? <coughs> Great. So uh, you don't have to go to Australia, although you might like to, to see this sort of phenomenon. You can see it very abundantly in Southern California, <coughs> where this is wave action uh, along the coast near La Jolla uh, from an airplane, and you can see this, the, <coughs> the clouds and the stars overhead quite accurately, but this is a different uh, species. It's a photosynthetic species. So I get, meant to reverse these, but I didn't. It's this species. It's uh, a, the red is, photos, is chlorophyll, responsible for photosynthesis, and the little white dots are the bioluminescent organelles. And they are seen here by fluorescence, but if you turn the lights out and stimulate them, you will get light coming from those locations. And <clears throat> they, uh, this sort of phenomenon that we saw has, it was early pictured by uh, Escher. Believe it or not, this is an Escher. Doesn't look like his style. Uh, sh sh showing the light emission uh, from, <coughs> from the waves as they break individually. And that again is stimulation. And Escher included the Big Dipper, which those of you close enough may be able to see it. Well, this, uh, this doesn't seem to work too well, but it's up on the, in the sky there. And uh, you don't even have to go to the West Coast. You can go to the East Coast uh, and see it. And uh, Andrew Wyeth has depicted it uh, as a lobsterman pulling in a lobster trap. Now, why would a lobsterman go out at night to pick, uh, to, to pull his lobster trap in? Well, one can infer from the look on his face, which you can't quite see, that he's looking out to see if anybody is catching him poaching the <laughs> lobsters. Uh, but the stimulation in the water, he's depicted nicely, I think, and we can all go swimming almost any time and many of you have probably know of the, uh, uh, of the phosphorescent bays. They're not phosphorescent. It's bioluminescent bays in Puerto Rico, the, one of which is a very uh, uh, frequently visited uh, tourist site. Uh, but uh, to give you a picture, and this is one of the main objects I want to do in this talk, of the diversity of bioluminescence, is the tree of life, which on the bottom here uh, depicts all groups of organisms other than animals. And you see the major groups here are bacteria, archaea, uh, which are uh, a, an archaic type of bacteria, if you will, but very di distinctly different line, and eukaryotes. Uh, so the eukaryotes are on the right, and the prokaryotes, if you will, are on the left. And you can see here that there's really only three groups of organisms that are bioluminescent. The bacteria over here, whoops, the bacteria over here to the left, uh, <coughs> and uh, the dinoflagellates, which is what we've just seen on the right, and fungi. All the rest are uh, animals, but the animals uh, have bioluminescence only at the level of fishes, nothing more complicated, uh, more, more evolved than fish uh, exhibit luminescence. So they're mostly in the invertebrate groups of animals that are bioluminescent. And what I want to do is give you some actual pictures. It's uh, not meant to be a primarily uh, slideshow, but uh, there's a lot of pictures that uh, help us talk about bioluminescence by looking at the organisms. And I want to talk not just about the, uh, the individual organisms, but what the function of the bioluminescence is. Because invariably, uh, in science, when I'm talking about a phenomenon, the people will say, what's the point of that light? For example, uh, <coughs> there are many, many different uh, kinds of bioluminescent organisms. Well, let us go to this first. For example, what could do luminous mushrooms? Oh, thank you. That's very nice. What possible function could lum the light emission from luminous mushrooms have? Uh, 
These are from the Brazilian rainforest, and uh, these show that both this, this, uh, the, the stalk and the cap, the mushroom itself, are bioluminescent in this species. With different species, that varies, but in any event, the only hypothesis that has had any experimental support is that this attracts flying insects, so when the, the spores which the, which the cap is going to spread around are there, just as bees help pollinate flowers, uh, insects can come and pick these spores uh, and they actually eat the uh, mushroom as well and carry them elsewhere. Well, to, to go back to the slide I skipped, I want to emphasize in this, in this discussion, and I do welcome discussion, including questions if you'd like to interrupt, if, if they're short and not lectures like mine, uh, <laughs> uh, that there, uh, uh, and you saw on that phylogenetic scale that there's, they occur in very different phyla all over the map. And that's difficult for uh, evolutionists to, to explain, to say how did that appear here and not appear in the organisms <coughs> between it and the next evolutionary line. Um, and that's one question I want to try to propose an answer for today. Uh, and when you see that there's, oh, oh one for few, there's very few members of any given group. There's some exceptions, but not many. Usually, there's, uh, <coughs> I showed a lot of bacteria there, you, you saw. There are six or seven different genera of bacteria, but there's millions of genera of bacteria altogether. So the ones that have retained bioluminescence are, are, are very few and, so to speak, far between. And, and there are many, very many different functions. So the ones for mushrooms are only a single type of function, there's others. But the genes are different. Now that is contrary to the common, the, that is different to the common experience in biology, that the genes for, we, oh. <laughs> But, but, no, it's yours. Barbara, it's yours. Yeah, okay. Uh, usually in biology, the muscle, the gene for muscle in a, in a fly has sequence that is similar to the <coughs> genes for muscle proteins in humans. We can connect these all and say there is a phylogenetic connection here. Uh, so if there's different genes, there will be different chemistries. So that's a remarkable thing about bioluminescence is that they, all these different groups, although the ones that are close together have the same chemistry, ones that are any distance apart, the one thing that they have in common is that they all use oxygen. And that's the key on which I want to, uh, to, to end tonight. Uh, so in addition to, we're still on those uh, uh, other thing, other than animals, I want to tell you a little bit about luminous bacteria because they are so remarkable. This is a plate of, uh, <coughs> of bacteria, and each one of these colonies was created. Oops, uh, was created by uh, by from a single bacterial cell that grew up, and there's maybe 10 billion cells in each one of those little colonies, uh, <coughs> and they occur, you can find these in oceans anywhere in the world. I've not been everywhere in the world, but I've been a lot, a lot of places, and I always take a sample and see if I can isolate luminous bacteria. I've never failed, never failed from any location, the earth from the Arctic to the, to the polar seas to everywhere. Uh, and uh, so, but you never see any light from bacteria in the ocean, except for one exception, that I'll come to in just a moment. But you never see it. You, you, it it's, what you see in the ocean is, are those dinoflagellates and some jellyfish and other things and so forth. There's a lot of them. But in any event, <coughs> when you see light in the ocean like this, 
it's coming from the fact that bacteria have <coughs> have become symbiotic with a higher organism. And this is in the Gulf of Eilat, in the Red Sea, near near Eilat, uh, about uh, 10 miles south of the city. Uh, uh, and uh, this is a Crusader island and a castle built there. In the background is uh, <coughs> Saudi Arabia. And overhead, you can see the uh, the, uh, the star is streaking, so it was a 40-minute uh, exposure. And that's due to fish, which have a light organ uh, uh, in their, uh, underneath their eyes. And here's a photograph taken by my student Jim Morin uh, of the fish underwater. They occur in groups, so that's why you saw those spots of light in the water. Uh, they, <coughs> the groups are from 15 to 50 perhaps, and, and you're, we were able to just swim out and just uh, grab some of these uh, on occasion, and we brought them back into the lab and did, did work in them, <coughs> on them. But there are bacteria in that light organ, which is underneath the eye. Isn't that a remarkable structure there, that the, a very bright light is right next to the eye? Well, there's a, a lid. Fish have no eyelids, <coughs> but they have a lid over that light organ so they can turn it off, so they can signal people. So that suggests that they can eat people or they can signal other fish so that they have functions that they can use it for. And here is yet another example of the kind of fish that's more popular in the popular press uh, <coughs> that, uh, that is an angler fish and it uses, it grows bacteria in the tip of that uh, <coughs> fishing line that is just above its mouth and that light, uh, light structure is where bacteria grow, and that attracts fish to come, or uh, attracts other organisms to, to come feed on it, and you can see those teeth uh, uh, are able to make a short shrift of, the, of whoever comes around. Uh, interestingly, the barbel on the bottom is also bioluminescent, but it doesn't have bacteria. It has its own chemistry, so two types of of uh, evolutionary lines are coming into a single organism there. Uh, and I drew up for just amusement, but I've found it very useful to talk about the number of different fishes that I know about that culture luminous bacteria. And you see uh, over at the left, the serratioid is the flashlight fish, and the anomalopid is the one underneath the eye. All of these other ones are also very, very interesting and, and, <coughs> and functional. And the function of the ones that are in the ventral portion, uh, we've discovered are due to uh, <coughs> the fact that they, can, they have a mechanism to illuminate their ventral sides with bioluminescence and match the intensity of uh, light coming down from the sky uh, so that they are essentially invisible. If you think of an airplane, that you see in the sky, if it could emit blue light of the same color and intensity as the sky behind it, you wouldn't see the airplane. And uh, that's been experimentally verified by uh, several groups now to show it. <coughs> now I said that there is an occasion when you see light in the water from bacteria. And I should qualify and say we think it's from bacteria. Nobody has proven it. But <coughs> uh, in the logs of merchant ships, that are kept in London since the 15th century, <coughs> there are many, many entries of, uh, <coughs> in which the captains write in the log that they came upon a milky sea. They came upon a spot where everywhere around them was all light and bright. The sky was dark. If you put a paddle in the water, the bioluminescence disappeared. <coughs> uh, there were scientists, including a friend of mine who, who knew about bioluminescence, having lunch. These were scientists uh, working on uh, satellite uh, spy cameras. He said, do you think our spy camera could ever see bioluminescence? And most people said, no, no, no it's too dim, too dim. Uh, we don't notice bioluminescence very much. So one of them went home and, and looked up uh, on the web. And, and discovered about Milky Seas, that people had reported this. And he took that 
log from London and discovered a time and place <coughs> where there had been reported a Milky Sea and a satellite was overhead at the time with one of these sensitive cameras. And this is a recording from that satellite. So it really exists. And in fact, it, uh, 20,000 leagues under the sea describes it extremely accurately. So uh, uh, Jules Verne had obviously made use of the logs of, of merchant ships as a way to, to describe things. And this was a, a clue. It's off the Horn of Africa. The, at the left, you see where it is. The Red Sea goes up to the left. Uh, and Saudi Arabia and uh, other countries of the Mideast are there. And uh, this is just a blow up on the right. Shows its size. And that satellite came around uh, in sequential nights. And for three nights, that was still there, a different shape, though. So it, it, the water, the currents had moved it a bit. But it was a, a quite remarkable thing. So uh, that's all I say about the <coughs> non-animal <coughs> species, uh, the fungi, the dinoflagellates, and the bacteria. And let's now just take a look at a few of these uh, uh, organisms that are in the upper part. The jellyfish Aquaria is uh, perhaps one of the most famous jellyfish uh, because it A is the jellyfish in which green fluorescent protein, which those of you who even read the popular press will know about, it's a very important protein, fluorescent protein, that is, a, <coughs> is found in the bioluminescent system of this organism and it uh, is the emitter. It's the emitter, but you can separate it biochemically, and you can separate, you can isolate the genes. And uh, this protein is now used in biomedical research, in uh, cancer research, in uh, as a way to uh, locate a, the product of a specific gene. So our genes produce ultimately proteins, and if you want to know where the protein for gene a gene, if you've got a, a disease gene and you want to know where that protein is expressed, where does the gene do its action, you can attach the GFP gene to it and find it in the body right away. And I do have one slide I'll show you later in which the same technique is used using the luciferase, using the, the luminescent protein instead of the uh, accessory protein. But anyway, each, each of those tentacles has a, a photophore at its base, at its origin, when it comes out. So the uh, uh, organism, you can see the bell-shaped uh, 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 cap of the, uh, uh, of the jellyfish with, with jelly all, all around there. Uh, this is what green uh, fluorescent protein looks like at the molecular level. These are strands of amino acids that are represented. And in the very center, you can see a few balls there. And that's the actual molecular structure of the fluorescent molecule of the fluorescent substance that uh, gives this protein its color. And this is an example of how you can transfer genes from <coughs> into other organisms. This is a transgenic organism uh, in which the green fluorescent protein gene has been transferred to a gene in the fish, and so now the fish is is green, uh, seen under <coughs> a provided light. Well, so much for the for the cilenterates, which is that group. This is in the crustacean group, and this is an ostracod. Uh, these uh, animals are about two millimeters, so they're just pint-sized little things like this. But they have two glands, and they create their luminescence by squirting from each gland and it mixes in the seawater. And it mixes with a goo and a jelly. So it makes a, a small a glob, I like to use that word. My colleagues don't like that word. Uh, but it's a glob, it's a, a little of, of luminescence. And uh, it was just thought that this organism uses that to scare predators. And in fact, there are experiments very clearly showing that it can use it for that. But uh, one of my students in the 
1990s discovered that in fact the males of this species use it to signal uh, there are to attract, I should say, a, a courtship attractment uh, of females. And uh, of course we are acquainted with that sort of idea with that you can use light to attract a female, of course, uh, as fireflies do it and so forth. But these guys, and just, so this has never been published before. Uh, this is from their work, uh, Jim, James Moran, uh, and shows m male uh, ostracods uh, uh, upon encountering a female uh, doing their dance which is a whoops doing their dance I must have done something here <coughs> oh I guess I've unplugged it probably can somebody say let me turn the light on first yeah <coughs> there there are many females that obviously have that's connected. Yeah, I don't think I did anything here. I don't. Well, I, yeah, it's on now. Okay. Um, Uh, from a single female, there are many males who are interested in that female, and they each individually fan out and put their blobs in the ocean. This is, and they have videos of this. It's really remarkable. Uh, and you see there are horizontal, there's, there are different species. Some species do it horizontally, and some do it vertically. So uh, there must be a, a popular song that relates to that, I suppose. <laughs> Uh, so there's a there's a yet a, a, a newly discovered and extraordinarily interesting uh, use of bioluminescence uh, for courtship. And of course, I already mentioned the fireflies, which are beetles, by the way, they're not flies, uh, 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 exchange signals uh, in in courtship. The male will is the query. He he makes the first query, and the female will respond. And there's information in those queries related to the time uh, between flashes and so forth. So that uh, there's no cross-species problem. A remarkable uh, f development of this sort of firefly use of light for courtship is in Southeast Asia, and uh, uh, there are. Is this working? Yeah. Uh, and there are now known examples in the south of the US, southeast USA. Uh, <clears throat> oh, I forgot about this, sorry. Uh, so uh, I worked on fireflies at Johns Hopkins uh, <clears throat> and uh, in that errant period of my life, uh, as described by, by Ked, uh, and we collected uh, uh, obviously thousands, I suppose millions really, of fireflies uh, in the Baltimore area and uh, we brought them into the lab, immediately uh, put them under high vacuum and removed all the water and that preserved all the chemistry very beautifully and then we separated the, the light organs, the tails, uh, from the bodies and used them separately for different experiments. And this is uh, William McElroy who was the director of this work at the time. Uh, but what I wanted to uh, jump onto was in Southeast Asia the uh, fireflies inhabit trees along riverbanks and flash synchronously. So, uh, and uh, we went on an expedition in New Guinea uh, to first look at this in the 1960s, uh, and uh, they uh, flash up and down the river. There's a flash, flash, flash. Everybody in synchrony, uh, uh, extraordinary. And Ivan Palulin uh, was able to get uh, really beautiful pictures of this. And this is a double and a time exposure. So the double exposure means that before dark, he took a picture to have the <coughs> background sky visible. Then after dark, complete dark, he, he did it at time exposure. Left the camera open for, let's say, uh, 20 seconds or something like that. And you can see these dotted lines 
going from one location to another where the male said, hey, I see a better location. I'm going to move over there. And it, the males sit on the leaves of these trees and surround a female. The females are sitting there watching this, uh, uh, probably enjoying it, I guess. Uh, and uh, and uh, But there's no copulation uh, during the nighttime that we could ever see. It always occurred at dawn. So it's a, an all-night uh, all uh, uh, operation. Uh, <coughs> here is a picture taken by a, a amateur photographer showing that the male on the leaf rotates his organ. So the female has a, several males surrounding her with, uh, <coughs> with that, uh, a number of males rotating like that. Uh, uh, other be fireflies are beetles, as I said. There are many other beetles that are bioluminescent, and I, I put this one on because it's an example of the fact that within a single organism, the bioluminescent systems are the same, but one emits red light and one emits green light. So it's the, it's the same chemistry, but it's a different protein. So the enzyme of the red one has a different amino acid sequence than the enzyme for the green one. Uh, other beetles are common in South America, luminous beetles, and one of them uh, inhabits termite mounds. I don't know if any of you have ever been to the Brazilian uh, countryside. They're not just in this location. This is from the Cerrados in the central Brazil, but all over Brazil there are termite mounds uh, that look like this. Uh, and one of my former uh, associates uh, went out and, and studied these carefully. Uh, these are a click beetle larvae that cohabit uh, with termites, the termite mounds. And who gets what? The symbiosis, if it is that, has never been studied. But at the left, he took a picture of a termite mound at night. On, on the right, he took it with no f left with a flash, no flash. You see them, and uh, he just superimposed some of those. That's that on the, the on the left. That's not uh, uh, that that's been superimposed for the location of the beetles uh, of the larvae. But uh, anyway, so there's a so what's what's going on there, and why are they bioluminescent? And uh, nobody's got any good ideas for that. Uh, this is an interesting story that I was involved in, in the 1950s. Uh, a colleague that I knew fairly well, a professor at my age, so at, at uh, uh, the newly founded uh, University of California, Santa Barbara, took his students on a uh, field trip to the uh, 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 <clears throat> a National Forest, and they, it was an overnight field trip, and they bedded down on the forest floor, which was uh, sequoia sequoia tree is beautiful and the, uh, <clears throat> very uh, comfortable. And one of them woke up in the middle of the night and looked around and there were about 30 or 40 spots of light uh, uh, around him. He woke everybody else up and they started picking these up and found they were little worms of some type. Uh, and uh, that uh, in fact, they smelled like cyanide, which they do. Uh, they took them back and had them identified they had, it was a new discovery. They had never found him before. And they uh, emit light all night long, just walking around. Uh, what is that for? Well, the, uh, uh, a study last year has claimed that it, that it prevents predators from eating them. But I would think the cyanide would be more effective. <laughs> uh, but it might be, as in snakes, like rattlesnakes, the rattle is a signal not to mess with me. And maybe the luminescence is a signal, don't mess with me. Uh, so I think that's a more likely ultimate explanation. Some of you have probably been to New Zealand where there are caves uh, for tourists and caves not for tourists, but they all have these animals on the ceiling. These are larval, larval diptera, larval flies. Uh, and uh, uh, this is a tourist boat going through to, to see it, and these animals attach themselves to the ceiling, and uh, uh, and from there they dr 
they produce and drop down beads of, of gooey slime. Now this is like sticky paper, which we don't have much anymore, but those of us who are older remember when to catch flies in your house, you hung a, uh, a, thing, uh, a strip of, of, of glued paper and the flies would all get caught in it. They get caught and there's in the middle there you can see an animal, a larva, who's coming down to eat his, his captured prey. Uh, and uh, this is cl clearly the use of, of this organism. Here's an actual, uh, <coughs> we've, we discovered also uh, there was one paper in 1940 reporting a relative of that animal in North America. Nobody had ever studied it until we did so in 2000. Uh, and this is it. We, Tom Eisner at Cornell loaned us that picture. We have a lot of pictures too, but his is the best. And the, you see those strands, and that's sort of like a railroad track. These guys, we brought them into the lab. They can just move around like mad. We fed them uh, fruit flies, uh, which you have on your bananas. <coughs> but we were fortunate that the guy next door to me at the lab at Harvard had a, had a uh, wingless fruit fly so that they wouldn't escape and these guys could catch them very easily. So in any event, uh, uh, that's, that's about for the show and tell part, uh, except for one thing I'll come to later, but uh, it won't be too long now. Uh, I want to talk about the biochemistry. I've spared you chemistry and, and I've detected in a number of lectures that the chemistry doesn't go down to too well in some cases, but I want, to, I want to use that to lead into what I believe is the evolutionary origin of bioluminescence. Now we've clearly convinced ourselves, at least me, that the light has a function. It's the function. In, in Darwinian uh, speak, you would say it's, that's the functional importance is what gives it survival value. That that particular trait is survives because it is functionally uh, important and gives it an advantage that others don't have. Uh, uh, okay, I want to I want to argue that uh, that the the original origin of bioluminescence was not for the light emission, but for something else. And let's see if we can. I lead into this without too much pain. Uh, so what is light? How do we create light? Uh, I like to, th to just distinguish two types of light. Incandescence <coughs> is light emission because of temperature. So if you heat something up hot enough, it'll finally get red hot, keep heating, it'll get white hot, so the spectrum will change a little bit, uh, or a lot actually. But that's incandescence. And our incandescent light bulbs are being phased out because they're very inefficient. You have, to, you have to heat up the whole thing in order to get a molecule to emit. Uh, and it, it is an electronically excited state from which light is emitted. So when molecules are excited by electrons being pushed up to a higher level, to a higher orbit, whatever, that, that's what finally results in light emission. But there's another kind of light emission, which is luminescence, and that's in which that electron that we're speaking of that is promoted to a higher level is done so specifically by a molecule putting the energy in to do it, just that one electron. The whole, elec the whole molecule doesn't have to be hot for, for that electron to go higher. And that's what we have in fluorescence, in phosphorescence, in electroluminescence, <coughs> in crystalloluminescence, there's all kinds of ways to create an excited state by putting the energy in very specifically. And bioluminescence is a chemiluminescence. And in fact, I think I brought along some of these light sticks, which are, are old hat now, so I don't think I need to spend much time, but I hope this one will work and hope I can get it open. This is like on an airplane trying to get your, your uh, candy opened. Uh, anyway. how, how, here's a. Maybe I can. You got it? I think I got it there. Yeah. There you go. I use a ballpoint pen. That works every time. Yeah. So uh, this uh, chemiluminescence is a chemical reaction 
in which enough energy is given off. And you all know, those of you who ski have probably bought some of those chemical pack packets. When you mix them together, they warm up, you put them in your glove, and that's the way. But in, in the light emission, instead of wasting that energy as heat, you simply, there we are, oh, you simply uh, cut, channel that energy directly into the, in, into the uh, excited state, so the molecule is going to be the emitter. We saw the emitter molecule in GFP, but, and if I had the energy to get another one open, I could do one and give you an, an orange light. I mean, they're, they're back here. Maybe we'll do them a, a little later. Uh, let's, let's go on here. Uh, so that's the basis, that's the basis sort of chemistry uh, of, of light emission. Uh, it's, so in bioluminescence, this oxidation is, there's no enzyme here. This is pure chemical, but in, bi in biology, there's always a, an enzyme, and they're always called luciferase. They're in the middle. Any enzyme that catalyzes a bioluminescent reaction. But I've also told you that, <coughs> that the firefly and the bacteria and the dinoflagellates and the jellyfish are different systems. So if you're gonna talk about luciferase, you have to say, aha, what do you know about firefly luciferase? What do you know about bacterial luciferase? They're all different. And the same goes for the substrate. So this, this molecule that is, <coughs> that is responsible for the light emission, and that's where the word luciferin comes in from the Latin, to bear, uh, to bear light. Uh, whatever that molecule is, and it might be a flavin, or a tetraparole, or a benzthiazole, all of those are from different different systems, so that's <coughs> that's what happens. And here's here's the sort of chemistry. And what I haven't really emphasized yet is that oxygen. I said it at the very beginning. Oxygen is the key. All of them use oxygen. So whatever that luciferin is up in the upper left, and I've just given an example of a molecule. It is oxidized, and what does it form? It forms a peroxide. And the peroxides, when they break down, is when the light emission occurs. And those of you who have played with peroxide, either to sort of clean clothes, where they also oxidize other things, or to uh, change the color of your hair, or whatever, uh, know that they are very, it's a very potent molecule. In fact, oxygen itself is a very potent molecule. <clears throat> and that's what I'm going to come to, because in fact, the Earth, uh, had life for a billion years. Now along the, the bottom axis there is million years, but take away the three zeros and it's billion. So three billion, two billion, one billion, now we are here at zero. It's, it's a, a backward scale. And the origin of the Earth is a sort of at the origin there. So the Earth uh, <coughs> is, is <coughs> calculated to have originated about 4.6 billion years ago. And uh, it was about 3.6 that life is believed to have first shown up after, after the Earth cooled off a little bit and gave us a little breathing time, uh, <clears throat> but with no oxygen. So the first billion years of life, there was no oxygen. Then photosynthesis was discovered, was evolved, was invented, and oxygen starts coming to, on Earth. Now oxygen, as we just said, is a very potent molecule. Uh, it will kill cells, and we are all cautioned to eat our daily dose of antioxidants, aren't we? I mean, it's still with us today. We believe that life is in a very close balance between being destroyed by oxygen and not having enough oxygen. It's, uh, and yet oxygen is the real secret to, to the higher life, which finally began to take off at a, at a billion years there. Uh, there you see the oxygen is really rising, and that's when there was the explosion, the famous Cambrian explosion of life. And that was because the real mechanism of getting energy from molecules was, was discovered to have to, to use oxygen. And that was a lot of fun. So what did I pass over there? Uh, and that is the point that I was making earlier. What was the selection pressure that originally resulted in luciferase and light emission? Was it the light that was important? 
Uh, <coughs> today, it's clear that it, it is the light, uh, and the experimental demonstration is clear. But my proposal is that luciferases did not originate based on light emission, but on oxygen removal. So if, if, if when f oxygen first appeared, cells were challenged, either you die or you do something to get rid of this oxygen, <coughs> luciferase, light emission, luminescence is a wonderful way to do that. There was no bioluminescence before oxygen, of course, oxygen is required. <coughs> oxygen was highly damaging to cells, and cells that evolved methods for removing would survive, and luminescence is a fantastic way to do that. And light emission at that time was then just a product, uh, a byproduct. It wasn't important. They, you get rid of it. In fact, that was the way to get rid of that energy. So light, uh, a photon of light has quite a bit of energy. Uh, you know, ten, 10 times or between 5 and 10 times more energy than the high energy molecules of biology. Uh, anyway, so that's the hypothesis that I want to leave you with, uh, and uh, 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 that it arose in early evolution as a way to detoxify oxygen. It occurred at that time, you would imagine that if there were some primitive cells that had evolved that were all anaerobic, uh, uh, that, that it would have occurred many different times, and that can explain and they were not constrained by what had been done before. Whoops, I keep. They were not constrained by what had been done before. Uh, so they didn't invent their own chemistry, but they all had to use oxygen. Uh, and as evolution proceeded, such cells developed into many different lines, and that could account for the widespread phylogenetic distribution. And uh, I think I have one more here, yeah, because the main part is, uh, if you didn't do that, what would happen? If you didn't, <coughs> when oxygen concentrations became high, as we saw it comes later in time, luminescence was probably no longer adequate for oxygen removal. Uh, and other methods surely were brought into play, which we have today. Uh, but some cells survived by evolving functions for light emission. Others, maybe most of the bi original bioluminescent systems or organisms uh, were, became extinct. And the survivors are spe sporadically distributed uh, uh, phylogenetically. Well, I think that's about what I want to do. You all, I hope, or some of you will remember Victoria and Lizzie. I'm not sure how Victoria got uh, moved off s screen there. But I do want to put one more slide in which I was urged to mention, and that is I have not talked about the uses of bioluminescence, which now are just enormous all over uh, uh, our lives, heavily in medical. Uh, our meat in, in abattoirs is tested for a, by a bioluminescent assay. If you, do a, a, if you do a swab and test for bacteria there, it's tomorrow when you learn about it. By that time, it's in the hamburger joint in Seattle, uh, and uh, people are already dying, which they do when when the tests, they don't test every carcass. They test, they, they do it when every so much. Water is tested. All of our soft drinks are tested for the presence of fungi by a bioluminescent assay, not, not, by, <coughs> not bioluminescent fungi. This is a, uh, 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 one of my former students uh, in Japan who is working on using luciferase to image uh, tumors uh, by virtue of their light emission. He's attached, just like GFP can be attached to uh, 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 another gene, so can luciferase be attached to another gene. And luciferase has advantages. The whole thing can be done in total darkness, so you have no background fluorescence or anything. And this uh, <coughs> is an example of some of his ex experimental uh, published re reports on that, and it's still going on. And he's not the only one. There are labs everywhere doing this. So there's lots and lots of very important functional functions or uses, uh, practical applications for bioluminescence. And this is a, a wonderful, wonderful example of a uh, of science in which uh, a research at the 
uh, at the outset was done with just pure curiosity, nothing else than curiosity and interest, and has turned into a very, very important thing. So I'll end there. I'm glad to take questions. You want to moderate this? Yeah, let me come up and help. But let me let me begin by asking a question, which is. What are some of the other uses now of, 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 of applications of bioluminescence in, in, in the Well, one big one uh, is DNA sequencing. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> the, uh, <coughs> if you want to sequence the DNA rapidly, uh, they use the uh, uh, four nucleotides, uh, uh, which have different responses and give them different peak heights, and this is all automated. So they're using firefly luciferase as a way to do it. That's one big example. I did mention soft drinks are all monitored. For, I think medicine is where the biggest use is, and uh, I think GFP is used much more than luciferases are, but GFP has a disadvantage that it's, you have to, put a black light on it to see where it is. Okay. And that excites other things. But it's, it's very important. I, first of all, I wanted to welcome the students who are here, which is terrific. We're so pleased to have you here this evening. And open up, what questions do you have, whatever? Yes? In terms of the origins of bioluminescence, yes. are, are you suggesting that um, the pressure imposed by oxygen caused bioluminescence to be um, invented independently uh, among a number of species, or that there's some common ancestor that that we no longer know about. I'm just wondering why. The, the first of your two choices, yes, uh, independently, in the different cases, and uh, it, it, of course, we, we don't want to do a Lamarckian thing. It didn't cause it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It it didn't cause it. Uh, it uh, it was discovered by the organism, and hey, that works, and I survive. Back well, there. Way no, in the back. Way in the. Come again. Well, people have looked. That's a very good question. People have looked. Is there a, is there a uh, cryptic luciferase genes? And and I don't know of any successful discovery of that. Uh, but it would be a very th interesting thing to find. Uh, and, uh, and and it might have some other function, is what you're proposing. Yes. Yes. Can you run that past me just once more? Sure. Yeah, that's better. Stand up. Um, yeah. I was wondering, since the luciferous process of bioluminescence uh, takes oxygen out of the cell, yeah. it's an antioxidizing process, Yes. does it increase the longevity of the cell? Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a also... Uh, a good <laughs> question, but to my, I don't know how you do the experiment. I mean, you want an experiment, don't you? You don't want me to speculate, do you? <laughs> yeah, th no, I mean, uh, first of all, as I indicated at the very end here, <clears throat> by the time oxygen got to be 21%, a luciferase reaction would no longer be able to do, do, do very much in terms of the total load that's there. So whether a present day cell uh, that's luminescent lives longer because of it, I, I don't know. I did want to mention that in fact the bacteria which give the best evidence, the luminous bacteria that live today, give the best evidence in favor of this hypothesis. <clears throat> present day luminous bacteria, if you grow them up, 
over 5% of the protein is, is luciferase. So it looks like when they last gave up using that system to get rid of oxygen, they were making a heck of a lot. So there's many, many copies of the gene, <laughs> many uh, RNAs are made and so forth. So, yes? Do you know of any of those symbiotic relationships with a bioluminescent organism and non? Have they done any isotope tracers to see what they're eating and what they're bringing to the arrangement? Say it again. <laughs> So I do isotope studies, but I don't do... Why would isotopes have anything to do like with it? Like a diet tracer where you can juice the system with C14 or something and see who's consuming it. Is that... Do you know anything about... The, the bacteria are bringing light. Right. Well, but when they're sharing, like the termites and the, the beetles, can you see maybe if they're dividing up food resources? Like why they're living together? Why would either one of them want to divide food resources? Why are they living together? Well, uh, that, that in that case we don't know. But if you want to, yeah. if you take a, something I know something about, uh, <laughs> I was just curious if you'd see any diet studies. I don't know of any diet studies, and I don't. You okay. see, I think what the common statement would be: uh, the host uh, is able to use the light emission to its advantage. Okay. And the and the. Uh, Bacterium, the symbiont, is able to have a place to live and sleep. I mean, room and board. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so it gets its nutrients almost exclusively from the host. You see, uh, I, I, I thought I qualified that termite thing in saying it's a kind of symbiotic okay. relation. I don't think anybody is, has actually called that symbiosis. You just, you would remind me of something about some Argentinian ants, that, and they were using isotopes to try to figure out exactly how much food went to one versus yeah, the other. Yeah, so okay. Uh, okay. If you okay. did that. No, that, I don't do that. <laughs> yeah, there's one here. Yeah. Yeah. And, and the risk of uh, total problems. In the chemistry, is it singlet oxygen that's involved, or is it normal oxygen that's involved? Normal. Yeah, no, not singlet. Yeah. Yes. Yes, you said that uh, luminescence occurred independently, but I was wondering, do you think... It evolved independently. Right. Do you originated. Believe, do you believe that uh, organism, it, uh, mutation occurred with luminescence had to eventually come about to evolve? Yes, yes. I was curious, do you find more luminescence organisms in, in warmer or colder climates, or are they equally distributed? I'd say warmer, mm -hmm. definitely warmer. Uh, but I spent a, a time on a uh, student uh, training ship in Alaska, and I gave all my lectures at 3 a.m. Uh, I mean, I just went out on deck. It, it was just spectacular. But this was July, uh, or June or July, yeah. Another? Any more questions? I, yeah. I, would, I would add to the last one, by the way. We're in Chicago, and you know, temperature here, and it's still going. <laughs> yeah. My question. Everyone's asking very sciencey things, but um, I work with children. What is your favorite bioluminescent organism? I like to share with the kids. Ah, ah. Well, um, let's see. I, I, I don't make. I don't have favorites among my children. <laughs> experienced uh, paddling a canoe in the, mar in the lagoons in Puerto Rico. I you know about that. Yeah. But we spent a lot of time anchored on the water at night in the British Virgin Islands. And there's a different kind of luminescence that occurs. And the curious thing to us was that it only seemed to happen on the with high moon, or full moon. The luminescence, only yeah. And it was like, and they think they're moving around and gyrating. Oh, that sounds like that, that sounds. Oh, yeah, yeah. They. That's right, and it occurs for only three days a month at the time of the a new moon, uh, and it's a. It's called the Bermuda fireworm, and it's a uh, the. <clears throat> the male and the female engage in a ritual dance, yeah. which is really both animals 
their, their gametes, their sperm and eggs, uh, are just dispersed in the water, but they swim in a circle of fire, so to speak. I think there's a picture of that in my book. Of uh, it's, it, it was very difficult to get a picture of it, but I've seen it uh, in Bermuda, and there's a spot down where the railroad used to go in the water. Yeah, right. Uh, thank you, Professor, for your, your illuminating lecture. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. Uh, I'd like to ask you about a, kind of a speculative question. You mentioned that for the eukaryote, it goes up to about fish. Why did it not go beyond the fish to other higher level? Yeah, levels? yeah. I haven't worked. I haven't worked up a good uh, discussion of that. It's uh, the, uh, if I could divert the question. There's also another question. There is no bioluminescence in fresh water. Uh, no, I mean, there's Lake Baikal that's 4,000 4, feet deep and plenty dark. Nothing there, I mean, at, at all, no location. Uh, so uh, there's one uh, limpet, snail, that occurs in, the, in, a, in a small stream in a golf course in Wellington, New Zealand. <laughs> and that's the only one that's ever been reported. But, uh, so back, uh, yeah, uh, wh why, I mean, we could, we could rest our argument on this phylogeny issue by saying that uh, none of those higher organisms trace back far enough. Uh, but I don't, I, I, I don't buy that, really. Yeah, behind you. Yes? You said that your book was available now? It, yeah, family? Amazon has it listed, and somebody told me they got it. Good, thank you. Yeah. Way in the back. Um, Speak up, please. OK, will do. Um, how, do you have any idea how many times uh, bioluminescence has evolved independently? And how different is the early evolution to uh, get rid of oxygen, different from, I assume, what the current evolutions are to, for uh, predatory reasons or mating or whatever. Is there like a real demarcation with that? Uh, first question, how many times? As I said, uh, many, 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 many may have gone extinct. And there's no record in the fossil record of, of light emissions. We were discussing earlier today with an ichthyologist as to whether any of the fish light organs, that, like the one I showed, for example, or two of them, uh, are in the fossil record. And he, he demurred. He, he said he didn't, didn't know of any example that they'd ever seen it. Uh, when I first wrote on this issue 30 years ago, I proposed that based on the present day living uh, organi uh, bioluminescent organisms, that there are 30 different independent origins. Uh, I've been up, uh, <coughs> my auntie's been up by 10 by somebody who wrote an article about five years ago. He now, he says 40. But uh, he didn't give the, I, I gave the table of the bioluminescent organisms uh, and evidence as to which ones had some genetic relationships and which ones did not. And I came up with 30. He didn't, he just blat blatantly up to me 10. <laughs> <coughs> Any more questions? Well, thank you all for coming. I, first of all, I think, I think a wonderful combination of the Harvard and the Newton Academy. I would mention the Field Museum has an exhibit on bioluminescence opening next month, and, and I would urge you to go there. Thank you all, and particularly thank you, Woody, for coming thank you tonight. For inviting us. Yeah.